now. Okay, so you'll be able to come okay, back. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. All right, so they're the cranial nerves. You're going to have to, I gave you good tips on cranial nerve 12 and 9 and 10. Okay, those are important cranial nerves for you to know. Um, I'm just going to kind of um, go by here. Okay, so having a lumbar puncture. Now, you're going to have to know, you're going to be doing um, an activity about or a case study about lumbar puncture this week. That's gonna be highly tested. I noticed it was on practice A, so I have a feeling it's gonna be a proctor topic. So you would do this on somebody you suspected had meningitis. Um, you put them in cannonball position, which I have pictures of this, I'm gonna show you, but I'm gonna say it again, cause it's important. Um, and it's to get, it would be to get cultures. The contraindication is if somebody has increased intracranial pressure, you cannot um, do a lumbar puncture. And when we get to that, I'll talk about that a little bit deeper. All right, again, here is the, let me get rid of this. Okay, here are, um, the different levels of head injury that I've already talked about. You will definitely have to know that. This is the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay, now I already made a recording on this and I already have this handout and these are mnemonics, okay? So this is what I suggest. You practice, there's a quiz that I put in your class and you practice, um, you could have, even have this in front of you while you first start doing it and then you know, see how well you do. Um, but this, this information at the top, what I've already discussed, is important as well. Because less than eight, you got to intubate. All right. So, um, again, early signs of increased intracranial pressure is going to be the change in LOC. Remember that. Okay, again, here's your Glasgow Coma Scale. This must be important because I had it three times in here. So you need to know less than eight intubate. Um, so if somebody comes in with an injury, they're going to have a non-contrast brain scan in the CT scan, sorry. And the reason they do that is because blood shows up as uh, white and so does contrast. So that's why they do a non-contrast scan because if the patient's bleeding, it will show up as white and they know they didn't give contrast. So they know that means that they're um, bleeding. All right. So your priority assessment is always going to be A, B, C, D. Um, but when somebody has a head injury, you're going to stabilize the spine as well, especially the cervical collar. They're going to be have a hard collar on, right? Especially if it's trauma. You are not allowed to touch that hard collar around the neck until you have an order for a physician. And a physician will give that order after they've studied the x-rays, the CAT scans, the MRIs to make sure the patient doesn't have some type of spinal fracture um, or something that could cause a spinal injury. Okay. We talked about epidural hematoma. Here's a picture of battle sign, which is basilar skull fracture. But the patient with epidural hematoma may also have like ecchymosis around their eyes. All right. So we talked about that. We talked about subdural hematoma um, and subarachnoid hematoma or hemorrhage, I should say. Um, we test the drainage from ears or nose for glucose. We can also test it for halo sign. Those are the two things we can test it for. Um, we're going to go over some of these medications. Um, mannitol, so you know that's an osmotic diuretic. So it's given um, to pull fluid off the brain, so to speak, okay? It's given slowly because one of the uh, contraindications, not contraindications, one of the adverse effects of mannitol could be pulmonary edema. As it's bringing more fluid into the vascular space, it may do it too rapidly. So you have to start it slow. 
Ferrosamide, of course, you know you have to check a potassium before you give that. It would be given along with mannitol to decrease, increase intracranial pressure. Phenytonin, many side effects. We'll talk about that a little later. Morphine is a great drug. Um, acetaminophen is a great drug. Phenobarbital, probably not going to give. Um, we don't give it that much anymore, I should say. All right, so... This basal skull fracture, I talked about a lot. Um, here are the meds again, phenytonin, phenobarbital. Now for traumatic brain injury, they would not give steroids, but for brain tumors, they would give all these meds and steroids. And I have the meds on a different um, page. Okay. Spinal precautions. Now, this patient, you see right here, can you see this right here? They have a hard collar around their neck. Now, so they came in with trauma, obviously, and they need to like roll the, you have to like roll the patient over when you get to the E phase um, to like strip them and flip them, that is what we call it. And the reason you do that is you're just looking real quick to see if there's any other injuries, but you have to roll any patient that is at risk of spinal injuries, we call it log rolling. So they, ha they have to be like moved, their shoulders, their hips, their legs moved in one unit, okay? It's the same thing if they had um, skeletal traction for spine immobilization, roll in one unit. And here, here's, oh, here's a better picture of a hard collar. So you wouldn't take this off until you got the okay from the provider. All right, injuries, spinal cord injuries that occur in T6 and above are at risk of some, for something called autonomic dysreflexia. This is highly tested. I noticed it was on your practice A. So what happens is there's some something irritating below T6. Um, something's irritating the skin, but the patient can't feel it. So the body starts sending messages, right? So what happens to the um, patient is their blood pressure is going to shoot up really high. They're going to have a throbbing headache. Their face is going to get flushed. Okay. Um, their heart rate's going to go down, which I know is unusual, but it does. The blood pressure goes up, the heart rate goes down, and they'll be sweating. Now, below the level of injury, they're going to be pale, cool, and no sweating. How I remember where the pale shows up is I remember that there's an organ down below that begins with the letter P. And that's how I remember that the face flushes and below the injury is pale and cool. Okay, so that's important too. Now, some of the most common things that cause autonomic um, dysreflexia include a full bladder, or a full bowel, okay, so fecal impaction. They could have a pressure ulcer. They could have a wrinkle in the sheet that they're sitting on. Um, they could have tight clothing. Um, oh, you know what another one is? Um, like if you uh, quickly change the environmental temperature, so you have to maintain that st stable. Like you, you wanna make sure they don't catch a draft, right? You wanna make sure you're not putting a huge fan on them. OK, so those are some of the things you have to watch out for. The first thing you're going to do if you suspect your patient has that is sit them upright, because when you sit somebody upright, their blood pressure drops. You're going to stay with your patient because this is like a medical emergency because they have a stroke out. You're going to call for help. Um, so you put the head of the bed 90 degrees at least. Loosen any constrictive clothing. You got to start looking for the cause while somebody else is bringing you the blood pressure medicine, um, you look for the cause. So look for a full bladder, make sure if they have a Foley that it's draining, um, look for a full bowel, look at for wrinkles in the sheets, uh, pressure in the lower limbs, make sure that the temperature hasn't gone really up high in the room or down low um, because they can't regulate their temperatures either. All right, to prevent this, of course, you need to get them on a bowel plan and, um, you know, make sure that they're able to um, remove the urine from their bladder with a straight cap every four to six hours. 
make sure they're on stool softeners, um, a laxative if needed, which you know is the last ditch effort. Um, no abrupt temperature changes, okay? Now, a halo traction I noticed is also on practice A. This is also highly tested. Um, this is an external fixator, okay? That you learned about, you learned about external fixators in MedSurge one when you did the orthopedic um, lecture. It's kind of the same thing. Um, the reason somebody would get a halo traction is to immobilize the cervical spine. So not everybody that fractures their spine has a spinal cord injury, but it needs to be fixed. So like they'll either have like a fusion after an injury or they'll get like a halo traction to um, immobilize the cervical um, spine so that they can heal, the fracture can heal. All right. So with this, there's a there's like a, um, a, a halo wrench that comes with this. You want to tape it to the chest because if they have need CPR, you want to be able to get the chest open. Right. You want, you know, the, the best off one finger should fit between the jacket and the patient's skin to prevent skin breakdown. You, it's just like pin care. So you're going to assess for infection at the pin sites. Never loosen the pins. Um, assess the chest and back for skin breakdown. They, anybody with a halo for, uh, traction cannot drive. You need to keep straws nearby because they cannot drink from a cup. They cannot move their neck or their head. Um, you need to cut food into small pieces because you don't want them to choke because you don't want to have to do the Heimlich maneuver on them. Um, you want to increase food, fluids and fiber in their diet because they're going to be not have their like normal um, activity. Um, and they're going to get constipated. So the halo may throw off balance. That's going to be a huge safety issue with them. They can have sex, but you're going to have to teach the partner. They cannot grab the halo traction. Okay. Um, pin care as ordered. Definitely. Yes. Ms. Cohen, so when you, I think one of the questions was, I remember if you have to move them in the bed with a halo traction or whatever, oh, yeah. what do you move first? Like, do you move the halo or do you move okay, the I rest? think yours was, that was about skeletal traction. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so you log roll. Log roll, okay. okay everything in one plane. I okay. think it was that, but if you did have a question about a halo traction, you never, you never, you should never grab that um, fixator, so to speak, to move somebody. Okay. Yeah, never, never touch that. Never touch that. Got it. Yes. Yeah. All right. So there are some neurological tests you're going to need to know for the exam. I told you about cranial nerve 12, how to assess that, um, the gag, and then the Romberg test, and this is to test for um, balance and equilibrium. So you have the patient stand with their feet together and their arms out to their side. You test with the eyes open and the eyes closed. A positive test means they start swaying or lose their balance. So that means they either have an inner ear problem, like you learn um, Meniere's disease, I think, was on practice A too. Um, so it could mean an inner ear problem like Meniere's disease or um, a problem with the cerebellum. So that would be a positive Romberg test if they're swaying. Now, the next test I told you, the LP, I've got a picture here. Now, you need to know the positioning. It, we call it cannonball or knee to chest position on their side. It's not done in patients with increased intracranial pressure, and the patient must lie flat for several hours. And then post LP, your job is to get more fluids into them because the, you, know, you want to replace what was lost. Um, and they need to lie flat so they don't get a spinal headache. The next assessment sign or test is nystagmus. Nystagmus happens in um, multiple sclerosis. It happens in, it, it could happen uh, for people that are taking phenytonin. And what it is, it's like involuntary movements of the eyeballs. And if, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you ask somebody to like look at your finger and to the side, OK, their eyes could start shaking involuntarily and that's called nystagmus. OK, so 
Think about safety if somebody has nystagmus because they probably can't see well either. And it could be transient too, meaning it comes and goes very quickly. Cerebral angiography, um, this has iodine-based dyes, so remember to ask about shellfish, but also check the BUN and creatinine and no metformin before and hold metformin after. That's really important. Um, it, and the movement is going to be restricted, especially if they go in through the groin, like you learned about cardiac catheterization, I think, in med surge one. It's, just, it's the same thing. Instead of looking at the heart, they're looking at the brain. Okay, and check for your six P's in the limb that they use to go in. All right, and then CT scan, same. It's, if they're using contrast, you do the same interventions, right? You check for metformin, make sure it's held before and after, make sure they have a good BUN and creatinine because they could, you could, patient could develop kidney damage if you're not careful with that. All right, and then this is usually highly tested, the EEG, and it's used to detect seizures like electrical activity in the brain usually when people have seizures like they're trying to determine what's causing it so some of the nursing implications is the patient's going to need to stay awake like the night before they're going to need to wash their hair so that um, they get all the oils off so that those electrodes can stick to it um, no sedatives or stimulants 24 to 48 hours before and they may be exposed to flashing lights or acts to hyperventilate because when you hyperventilate, they're going to become alkalotic and that could induce a seizure. So they're trying to like, in other words, they're trying to mimic um, some of the triggers of what usually causes seizures to see what the electri electrical activity in the brain is like. Okay. And you know, with an MRI, you've got to check for pacemakers or metal inside the body. Okay. And then if anybody is complaining about back pain, because this was another topic that was on practice A, um, back pain, and they're having these tests, you can offer them a lumbar pillow to put under their back in their lumbar region for um, pain relief. Okay. Now, this is, it, I'm going to talk about increased intracranial pressure. It can happen for a lot of different reasons. The 72 hours I have here is I was, uh, this is after a stroke. People are going to be prone to increase intracranial pressure. But really, we talk about a lot of things the brain, the traumatic brain injury, we're going to be talking about brain tumors. Um, we talked about um, the brain bleeds, all of these conditions, and meningitis, all of these conditions can lead to increased intracranial pressure. An increase in intracranial pressure has the same signs and symptoms no matter what the cause is, okay? So the normal value for uh, intracranial pressure is 10 to 15. Um, so you, you probably will never see in clinical, you know, how they measure it. My daughter works in a neuro ICU, and so she uses all that fancy stuff to measure it, but you probably won't. So you're going to have to re, re, uh, rely on signs and symptoms. Now, I talked about the earliest um, symptom of increased intracranial pressure is going to be that change in LOC. The patient may become irritable. They may become drowsy, then somnolent, then comatose, okay? Now, if you've been with your patient all day and they start posturing, okay, and you had no idea, you have missed all the other signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, okay? So posturing, you have to know decerebrate, decorticate. So decorticate is considered um, flexion, okay? That's when the body is flexed. Decerebrate is extensor. So you'll have to know the difference between, um, you know, uh, decerebrate and decorticate. And I have a picture I'm going to show you, and I'll go over that. Um, but those are late signs. Also, seizures are late um, changes in vital signs. Okay, there's something called um, Cushing's triad, and this is probably was was a proctor question, uh, practice question as well. So the vital signs are going to change. The systolic blood pressure is going to get way high. So that means they're going to have a wide pulse pressure, meaning the systolic blood pressure is far from the diastolic because it just shoots right up. 
their pulse or heart rate is going to be low. And they'll have an altered respiratory pattern, like if you've heard of chain st stokes breathing, okay? So, or agonal breathing, all right? So those are late signs. And, and usually if patients do have that Cushing's triad, they're not going to survive it. Okay, so again, here are your key features, change in LLC, irritability, restlessness, then they'll be, you know, lethargic to coma. Okay, so you're looking for those changes in LLC. They could have a headache. They could complain of nausea and vomiting. They could have a change in their speech pattern. So aphasia is somebody um, that can't talk or that maybe they don't understand you as well. Then pupil changes, cranial nerve dysfunction, ataxia, uh, seizures are late in Cushing's triad and posturing. Those are all late signs. So make sure you know you're early from your late. Okay, and this is just some pictures I've just talked about. All right, now over here, I've got some pictures of the posturing. Okay, so this is decorticate. See how it's flexion? So we say like the arms are protecting the cord. That's how we remember decorticate. So this is a lesion above the midbrain, mid brain, and decerebrate is extensive, ex, uh, extended or extensor is what they call it, posturing. And this means the le lesion is at the brain stem. So this decerebrate is more severe than decorticate. And how I remember that, I just think to myself, okay, this patient in flexion up here with their arms flexed, protecting the cord, they still have, they still have, know enough to protect their cord. But once they're starting to extend, the, the lesion is moved to the brainstem or it's like down at the brainstem. So that's, you know, a little more severe because they could have um, breathing problems at that point. Okay, so if you have a patient with a change of the LOC due to increased intracranial pressure, call your rapid, okay? Make sure you always check. If you have anybody with a change of LOC, your brain, remember I told you, runs on oxygen and glucose. So somebody that's hypoxemic or with low glucose could just, you know, just need oxygen and sugar, and that's an easy fix. So that's why you always check the O2 sat and glucose when somebody has a change in LOC. Check for your pupils, look for your cranial nerve deficits, um, and dim the lights. You want people, anybody that's at risk for brain injuries, you want them in a quiet room. Um, you want to dim the lights and no loud noises, okay? Um, don't give sedatives until they've been seen by a provider. The treatment of increased intracranial pressure, you can remember from your mocha mom mnemonic. So you're gonna monitor the increased intracranial pressure. Hopefully it'll get better. You're gonna give osmotic diuretics such as mannitol, but you're gonna give it slowly because you don't want your patient to go into pulmonary edema. Corticosteroids for other causes, not for TBI. Um, hyperventilating, like if somebody's intubated, because what that does is it helps drain the, in, uh, the increased intracranial pressure. Antipyretics, because temperature increases intracranial pressure. Um, and oxygen, obviously, and muscle relaxants. I wouldn't worry about maintaining the PACO2 30 to 35. Somebody's at my front door. Hang on one second, okay? Sorry, I'm going to turn off the recording. But somebody, I'm just going to stick my head out the door and then somebody.